Biology for the Leaving Cert is all about a strategy and studying smart. My name is David Lewis and I'm a biology teacher here at the Dublin Academy of Education and in this video I'm going to show you how the examiner loves to ask about photosynthesis. Previously, last year, on the Leaving Cert, photosynthesis came up and it was worth 24 marks. We feel that only this year it's only going to go up. Some people might feel it might pair back due to respiration, which I'll talk about later. However, we feel it's actually going to go up. And it could potentially, at the very, very highest end, be worth 15% of your grade. Okay, so what I'm going to show you in this video is the four questions that the examiner likes to ask, because previously we've gone into this topic with extreme detail. And that, link, that video will actually be linked below. So, first of all, what do you need to know as a student? You need to know a general overview of photosynthesis. And this can confuse students because they are maybe a little bit afraid of the light stage and the dark stage and different energy pathways. That is not relevant here. Your first port of call is knowing a general overview. So we're talking about the light getting absorbed, we're talking about photolysis, we're talking about producing glucose and a couple of other things. The second thing we need to be aware of, and this is actually a topic that can come up throughout the paper, not just in photosynthesis. Some of you guys might be aware of of it coming up in respiration, for example, but it can also be its own question, is energy carriers. And specifically with energy carriers, we're talking about ATP and NADPH. And let me just draw your attention here to the, to the P. I always say to my students, P for photosynthesis. And then for respiration, you're probably aware we don't actually have a P. We don't have to go into the nitty gritty behind that. That is not examinable. Okay, so what I'd like you to know with this is, first of all, what ATP stands for, the fact that it's a high energy molecule, the fact that once it uses its energy, it goes back to ADP, uh, which is adenosine diphosphate, TP being triphosphate. And then I'd also like you to know similar for NADPH. Now, as an, I wouldn't suggest that an examiner would put on uh, the exam for a student to write out those words, but they could. Uh, but, you know, 99.9% .9 of the country aren't going to get it, so it's going to get the examiner in trouble. But what you should know is that NADPH does not carry energy per se, it carries protons and it carries electrons. And those protons, if you're a chemistry student, forgive me for, for chemistry in terms of biology, but those protons and electrons combine with the carbon dioxide or the CO2 to form C6H12O6 or glucose, which is the whole purpose. Of photosynthesis. So, so far we've got this general overview that you know, and again you can put that in a diagram, some students actually enjoy doing that. The energy carriers don't go into too much detail, they can be high energy and low energy like a charged battery, then get, get used up and then they're a low energy battery and then they have to go around again and again. Then we're going to look at a detailed study, and your detailed study should be broken down again into segments. You should know first of all we've got the light stage, and second of all we've got the dark stage, and the difference between those, the light stage needs light for photolysis, the dark stage or the light independent stage just doesn't need light, it's controlled by enzymes. Okay. We also then in the light stage should break it down into three places. We have the light being absorbed, the pathways and then the products. So if you let me do that now, light being absorbed, that's photolysis, the splitting of water into, as we said, protons, electrons, but also oxygen, that's grand. Then we go down these different pathways, and very often students don't like these different pathways. One we know is cyclic and one is non-cyclic. Many of the books go into extreme detail, which is fantastic, but again, not all examinable. So you just gotta build your answer around this. If we have cyclic and non-cyclic, they are electron pathway one and two. And it's talking all here about energized electrons. In the cyclic pathway, the electrons bounce around from energy acceptor to acceptor to acceptor, losing energy to form ATP. And because they are cyclic, they go back to where it all began, where it all started. They go back to the chloroplast or the chlorophyll inside the chloroplast. They just literally go around in a circle. And they are used again and again and again. And that's all the detail you need for that. For the non-cyclic, the electrons do the exact same thing. They're bouncing around, they lose energy, ATP is formed again, but they do not return. They are non-cyclic. They join on to the low energy molecule of NADP+. They join on to this 
and they also join on with that proton from earlier. So again, chemists, this is absolutely horrendous chemistry, but in terms of biology, it's all we need. And they form this NADPH. Grant. The last part, part three, is the product. So what products have been produced from this light stage? Well, we have ATP, one. We have NADPH, two. And they're both going to be used in the dark stage to make glucose. And the last thing is, in photolysis, oxygen is produced. And we go again into a little bit more detail in the other videos about the fate of those. Uh, for the dark stage itself, you just have to know it is a light independent stage. It does not need light. You need to know that the uh, stomata, they absorb carbon dioxide. And then the energy is used again to make the whole purpose of photosynthesis to make C6H12O6. Okay, so don't get too complicated with your detailed study. I know I said detailed, but you just have to break it down into little parts. Uh, and if you're okay with the stuff we have on our, I forgot to say this by the way, the stuff we have on our A4 sheet of everything you need to know of photosynthesis, which you can download from our website, you will be fine for any question that will come up. The last part is the experiment, and this is the only experiment on the course, as we've discussed before, that there is a choice. 90% of you will have done the one where we talk about light intensity and very, very, varying the light intensity for the plant. 10% of you, maybe your teacher's a hipster, would actually have done the one where you vary the carbon dioxide levels. But they're actually just switching around. You just have an incredible amount of light and you vary the carbon dioxide levels. But our one that we focus on here is the light intensity. The one where we're actually moving the light closer and closer and closer to the plant. Then what actually happens is the rate of photosynthesis increases to a point and then it levels off because the plant is saturated with light. No more can get in. What I tell my students when they're learning experiments, specifically for this one, is again, you've got to be focused. What can the examiner ask you? They can ask you for an understanding or a, a general overview, but again, that's not a write-up. And if you can explain that with a diagram, you will be absolutely, you will do very, very well on those questions. You need to know this graph at the end, just for your results. You don't need to know numbers, you just need to know that. At the, and then the, tr the trick questions that throws students is, how do you measure the rate of photosynthesis? And people say the number of bubbles, and that's wrong. It's the number of bubbles per minute, because that actually gives it a rate. And the last thing is people always forget, you have to wait for the light to adjust. You're bringing the light closer or further away from the plant, you've got to give it five minutes for it to adjust so you can actually measure that rate. Okay. So you will see we're going to do another video now on respiration. We think this year at the Academy that they're going to be extremely interconnected and we'll discuss that, we'll discuss why at the beginning of the next video. But you will see how we've broken down this topic. This is what you have to do for the course. You have to see how much it's worth, how much it's going to be worth so you can invest a certain amount of time in it. And then in this case, what sort of answers do we need? Very often, the, particularly the stronger students, they can tell you all about biology, every single bit of it, tell you and then write you an essay on it but they find it very hard to convert all the knowledge they have to the types of questions the examiner asks. So that's what we try to do here. One, two, three, four. Once you're covered with that, we start applying them to exam questions. And sure, once you get into the exam, you'll have seen every single thing they can ask.